good to see all of you here today for this special service and uh, those that of us up here that we can't see that may be downstairs watching on uh, one of our televisions that we have set up in a in uh, several different rooms down there to accommodate everyone uh, once again thank all of you for being here there's several special guests here today and I'm not even going to try to call out names or, or recognize anyone because I know I'll just mess that up but uh, a couple of reminders here you know after our service today we'll have uh, a meal together to, to celebrate along with Pastor Ray so uh, at the end of the service you know, after Ray gets finished before he rushes out, I have a very important announcement to make about how we can kind of coordinate that so everybody can get down there and uh, uh, we can do that in, in a somewhat of an organized manner. So don't forget about that at the end of our service today. Uh, as we all know, this is a very special day as we celebrate Ray's ministry here at our church and his ministry over the last 60 years. So we're we're so grateful that, that all of you can be here today to share in, in this event with us. And it's a, uh, I know for Ray, it's going to be a challenging morning and challenging time uh, because of all the memories and all of the uh, thoughts and the time that he spent in the pulpit. And it's just one of those things. If you've ever worked in a, in a profession or a job for a very long time and done the same sort of work for a long time, then it's time to step aside and move on. You know uh, how emotional that can be. So we want to make it a good time today for Pastor Ray, but we also, as we're in, the, in God's house, we want it to be certainly a time of worship. Uh, so with that being said, as we welcome all of you here to our service today, one of our guests is Mike O'Dell from the York Baptist Association, and I'm going to ask him if he will come and lead us in our opening prayer. It's good to be here today, especially uh, for this service. Uh, Ray has served, I think we counted up 10, nine churches in this association, the York Baptist Association, over the years. And, uh, you know, he's a He's well-loved, well-respected across our association. He's a man of truth, a man of justice. But the thing that impresses me most about Ray, and so many conversations and times we've prayed together, Ray has told me how much he desires to see God pour himself out one more time. And I think we know our country's in trouble. So this morning as we pray, I think it would be fitting for us pray and beg God to open the doors of heaven, pour out his spirit upon this, upon his church first. His church needs desperately to be revived. But upon this nation for spiritual renewal, for spiritual awakening. So let's pray to that end. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you so much for all the work that you have done uh, through Ray and ministries that you've given him to oversee. And Lord, especially God for the, the good work that he's done here in this great church. And, and Lord, as we, uh, as we celebrate his service, his ministry here and through the years, uh, Lord, as he prepares for retirement, um, God, we know that uh, you're not through with him yet. There are many things that you have for him to do him and Mary as they continue in their, their walk with you. And so, God, we, we lift them up. We pray your blessings on them. You continue to use them for your purpose and your glory. And, Lord, um, we pray because his heart desires this so much. And, God, our nation needs it so desperately. And our, our church needs to experience your power. We beg you, Lord, today, pour your spirit out upon us. Help us, Lord, to to be aware of the sin in our lives and our own hearts. Bring us to a place of repentance so that we can surrender all those things to you so that you can do what you want to do in your church. And God, I pray that 
as a result of that revival that you would spill out into this nation. Lord, that you would bring about a spiritual awakening that would absolutely rock this nation to its foundation and, and bring this people that's, that's called uh, America uh, to you. Lord, we beg you for this. We ask you please, in Jesus' name, for it's in his name that we pray. just a minute, Dr. Robert Jackson and his wife Carlotta are going to share with us in a, in a song as we uh, continue with our service, but let me make one quick announcement to take care of some housekeeping. Up here there is a box on our stage area, um, and uh, in the box are copies of the book, The True Story, and that's a, a book that, we, that we're going to be using as part of a Wednesday night Bible study that will begin this coming Wednesday. And the story tells the story of the Bible in chronological order from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, so remember that starts this coming Wednesday night and the cost of the book is $7.50 and you can just leave your money in the box and remember it's right up here to my right on the floor. So with that being said, we have, are fortunate and blessed to have some special music today by uh, more than one individual. And we, uh, at this time, would like to present Robert Jackson, Dr. Robert Jackson, and his wife as they come and share with us. Good morning, church. It's our honor to be your guest today again, and uh, especially honored to be here on celebration honoring Ray and Mary Long. They're our long-term friends and they pastored us at Rock Hill Baptist Church 32 years ago. Can you believe that? Uh, let me tell you a little story that involves my brother Ray that you may or may not remember. <laughs> uh, about 32 years ago a man came into my office who had just moved to South Carolina. And he had just suffered a business loss and the suicide death of a close friend. And he was suffering from anxiety and panic attacks. And he was very honest with me in his office. And he told me, quite frankly, that he'd been an outlaw all of his life. He'd been in prison in 26 states. He'd been a professional gambler and he had managed casinos in Sparks, Nevada, right outside of Reno, five casinos and five motels. And he bragged and told me that when he was a casino manager that he never paid for women or booze or lodging for any of that time. He was also a womanizer, and he'd been married five times, and the woman that he was with at that time was not his wife. He was like the woman at the well in reverse. unbeknownst to me, God had been at work in this man's life. And en route to South Carolina, he had seen a, an evangelistic movie in a motel that had captured his attention. And now he was sitting in my office listening to me share my testimony and share the gospel. Well, then I invited him to go to church with me. And Ray was our pastor. And to my surprise, this outlaw said, I would like to do that. And on Sunday morning, he called me and asked me, was it still okay to come to church with me? <laughs> and I said, of course. He came to church and he sat through a Sunday school lesson on Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He had with him this woman who was a, 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 like a runway model, a very, very beautiful woman. And all the men in my Sunday school class were cutting their eyes and looking at that woman the whole time. They weren't paying a lick of attention to me. But this man, he had his eyes glued to me, paying perfect attention. And then Ray preached that Sunday morning on seven ducks in a muddy river. You remember that sermon, Ray? about Naaman the Syrian being cured of his leprosy by being ducked in the Jordan River seven times. And when the invitation came, this outlaw, this womanizer, this professional gambler was the first one down 
saying that he wanted to give his life to Jesus. Well, I went down there beside him, and I looked at him, and I said, Sir, do you really understand what you're doing? Are you for sure that you want to give your life, your whole life, the rest of your life to Jesus? He said, that's exactly what I want to do. And that man got on his knees and prayed and gave his life to Jesus right there after Ray preached that sermon. Now, let me, let me tell you this now. Over the next several months, he went from being a pro-choice advocate. He told me that he thought the best thing that ever happened to women was abortion to being a pro-life advocate and going to pro-life rallies with our church members. He quit being a gambler and working in a saloon as a card shark to make money on the side because he just told me, he said, I just don't think that's right for me to do that anymore. And, and, and I never said anything to him about pro-life stuff, never had any debate or discussion. I never talked to him about working in the saloon. And then he told the woman who was living with him that she had to go back to where she came from because, quote, it wasn't right for them to be living together anymore. And every Sunday after church, he would look at me after dinner and say, just talk to me about the Bible some more, please. Now, that was a radical transformation in the life of this man who had been an outlaw all of his life. And I say that to you, brothers and sisters, in this time of civil unrest in our country, to say to you, people need the Lord. That song, People Need the Lord, came out in 1983, I believe, my wife just told me, when Ray was pastoring our church. And Brother Ray, you probably heard me. I'm sorry. You probably heard me sing this when you were at our church. 32 years ago. Brothers and sisters, people need the Lord. Every day they pass me by. I can see it in their eyes. Need. 
But I did bring my books today. The story that I just told you about Frank is in this book, The Family Doctor Speaks, The Truth About Seed Planting. And I have a box of those books in the back of my truck, so if you want some, I have them with me. I also have my latest book that some of you read about in the courier, The Family Doctor Speaks, Turkey Tales and Bible Truth. That's mostly for men, but it's a, 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 a very interesting and humorous book about turkey tales and things that have happened to me in the last 30 years of turkey hunting. But it goes right into teaching Bible truths that men need to know. Now, I know most of you guys have not ever read a book since you graduated from high school. So if you wives will buy one and just read them a chapter every night before they go to bed, you can read them the whole book in three weeks. All right, enough of that. <laughs> Thank y'all for being here today and for sharing with us in that song. Uh, if you have memories like Dr. Jackson shared about Ray and, and his ministry down through the years, your memories we've announced the last few weeks here, we'll have an opportunity to share those uh, during our meal time. Uh, so be thinking about that if you haven't already, and uh, because there will be an opportunity to share uh, later on when we're uh, down eating our lunch. Uh, with that being said, we're going to sing some songs now, and as, as we've done the past several weeks, these are some of Ray's favorites that he's picked out for us, some hymns that are especially meaningful to him. Our first one is, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. We're going to sing the first verse of this because we're singing three songs this morning. So we're going to sing the first verse. If you want to use the hymn book, it's number 43. Otherwise, the words will be up here on our screen. So let's sing together the first verse, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Please stand. song is 572 in your hymnal and that is blessed assurance we're going to do all three verses so let's sing this one together
song, I wouldn't be much of a Baptist if I didn't remind you of this. You know, with the social distancing, we're not doing the traditional offering time, but that doesn't mean you can't drop off your offering as you, if you've entered the church already and done so, or on the way out, we've also got collection plates in the other locations where our worship is being viewed this morning. So, with that being said, our last song before our prayer time and special music is Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And uh, if you're using a hymn book, that's number 76. And as always, the words are on the screen. We're going to sing through this and then repeat it a second time. So let's sing together. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Robert is probably the best pro-life advocate in the state of South Carolina, without question. He, he, uh, he was one of the main persons in establishing the uh, Crisis Pregnancy Center in Spartanburg some years ago. And he has still been very active in the pro-life movement, speaks at banquets, uh, I could tell you some quite some stories about uh, Dr. Jackson and pro-life. He's no doubt been uh, responsible for the saving of countless numbers of children. And I, I promise you that there's no question about his. Uh, uh, let me tell you about him. I, you know, you, you heard about, the, I've told you the story. So now, you all know what that means? That means everything I'm going to say this morning has been said already. Okay? More than one time by me and by others. So there's nothing new under the sun, according to the Solomon. We had just moved back to Rock Hill, me and I, and uh, I'd been having some problems, and I really hadn't said anything to Mary about it, and, uh, you know, just, it'll pass. We got back to Rock Hill, and that problem persisted and got worse and worse. And uh, 
We didn't have a doctor in Rock Hill. We were, we were, we'd been away for a number of years. And uh, so I told Mary one day, I said, I'm going to call Dr. Robert. I said, uh, just see what the possibility. Long story short, um, Robert told his uh, receptionist to have me come in next morning. Told me what to do. She told me what to do in preparation. I did. I got there early one morning by myself. Me was working at uh, me was working at Winthrop. And uh, Robert performed an examination. I never will forget it, Robert. Whether you remember this or not, but he performed a, uh, an examination on me. He said, "Ray, get dressed. Come to my office." And I did. Robert sat down. I'll never forget what he said. He said, "Ray, I've never seen as much bleeding in my life. There wasn't cancer." Straightforward. You know what the next thing he did was? He called his companion, Steve Bales, in the office, knelt down on our knees, and those two doctors laid hands on me. He sent me directly to Spartanburg Regional Hospital, made arrangements for me to have further examination that afternoon. Y'all want to know what the results were? I was cancer free. Now I know what people say, but I know what I say. God still works miracles. That's the kind of guy he is. He prays with his patients. Great, great man of God. Uh, I could tell you some other stories. Uh, I know he's a great hunter. Those are things he's going to have to ask God forgiveness for killing deers and turkeys. Uh, I got some more stories I can tell. Wade, come on. Wade Belk and Sarah have been friends of mine and Mary's forever and forever. Literally. Come on, Wade. When I went to be pastor at the, Oak, at the Calvary Baptist Church in Rock Hill when I was 22 years old, 22, and uh, church had, the last two pastors had been asked to leave. They only had two pastors. Uh, Jerry Calvary, as you well know, was a, was a mission of Northside. Jerry Souls this year today, who uh, was pastor at Northside for many years. He's on our, Baptist, on our staff in the Baptist building. And uh, long story short, his dad was my music director, Jimmy Bell. Sometime later, Jimmy told me, Ray, I didn't vote for you to come as here as pastor. <laughs> he said, I won't tell you why. Because you were too young for a church that had so many problems. In time, he became one of my dearest friends, and I helped conduct both his mom and dad's funeral. And I asked Greg if he could come and sing mine and mama's favorite funeral hymn, and it's in our in our arrangements, right, Mommy? And we've made those arrangements, and it's written down. I'm still not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. And that's what I told the lady at the funeral home. We, we made our plans a few weeks ago, and uh, I spent our, our children's inheritance on a funeral. <laughs> but I'm not looking for that undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker, Mike. Come sing
I, uh, I hope you can say that this morning. It's well with my soul. Last, uh, last two weeks here have been some of the hardest that I have spent in the ministry in a long time. We had two of our most devoted members, Andy Adams and Nancy Brakefield, Go home to be with the Lord suddenly. It's taken a big, big toll on uh, on us. Mac, Howard, I want to tell you something. Where's Mac? You two people will never, ever know what an inspiration and blessing you are. That young man sat down here that Sunday when we were going to have his dad's service on Monday. Nancy and Howard went to service on Monday. I spoke with her. How you doing, Miss Nancy? Fine. Five o'clock. Tuesday morning, Greg called me and said, Nancy's had a heart attack. 
and I rushed to, I rushed to Piedmont. Nancy went home to be with the Lord. That's two. If that does not send a signal and a message to everybody, be ready, be ready. Amos the prophet said, prepare to meet thy God. But you two people, Mac, where is uh, Teddy? He's downstairs helping. I ain't going to give that to you, son. I'll see if I can't get you one. Those are the flowers off your dad's casket. And somebody made them, Mr. Black. I don't know which. Brother Black made that and sent that to me. I shall cherish that all my days. But you see, not only did we have two sudden deaths, on Wednesday morning, Mom and I went to our, our cardiologist, Dr. Edwards, very fine man, thinking we were going to have a consultation. Got there, and they told us that her blood pressure had gone to the bottom. And her blood pressure had gone sky high. And Dr. Edwards said she can't go home. This is Wednesday. I have that funeral on Thursday. I wasn't able to be there. We rushed to Atrium in Pineville. Dr. Bach, very fine electrician. I don't know what that is. Right there. He's an electrician. Works on the electrical system in the heart. They're waiting on us. tough moments. This, this service is not about Ray Long. This service is about this lady. I would not be here today except for the grace of God and a wife that is unparalleled. I had a mom who was the finest. There's an old song that most of these young whippersnappers don't know. I want a girl just like the girl that married the old man. Let me tell you something. She is a spitting image of my mother. Kind, gentle, loving, full of forgiveness. Ask these three sons here today, ain't she the finest boy? There's not another one in the world but my mother. I would not be here today. I would not be here today if it were not for her. And my daily prayer among many is that God would let me live to make sure she's well taken care of. That's one of my main goals in life. Love you, Mom. Mm -hmm. She's the best. These boys will tell you that. She is the very best that could possibly be. I can't take time this morning to thank everybody for being here. I I've got some wonderful friends here. If y'all who are visiting think I'm crazy, I am. I ain't a Mr. Bill. No comment. Well, you're a friend, aren't you? No comment. My goodness a lot. Huh? Man, I love you as much as I love anybody beside my wife and my children. That's one of the greatest men of God I've ever met. I'll never forget, Mr. Bill. I'm, I'm, I've been doing a lot of walking down memory lane these last few weeks, Mom and I have. I'll never forget, as long as I live, the day you sat, stood right here and your wife, Miss Ruth, had passed away. Remember that, that Friday night? Never will forget uh, Wanda calling us. We were coming down the interstate. And she said, we think Miss Ruth's dead. And you stood here at funeral. That you were here on Sunday morning right there. And she was already in heaven. Funerals on Monday. You sat there and sang. And she, you stood here at that funeral and sang. And then your son Billy passed away. How soon was that? Still a couple of weeks. And you stood and sang just like that on that Sunday morning. Billy had died on Friday. Miss Ruth died. He's a, he's a part of, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bill is a part of uh, 
I'm going to start unloading now. When I get to the bottom, we'll stop. He's a part of, Mr. Bill's a part of this. If you've never read that book, you need to read it. Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation. Mr. Bill is one of the few still here. Mr. John, who's in our church, not able to come now due to health problems. Mr. Bill, you're part of that great generation. Never read that. You need to read that book, The Greatest Generation. It's an awesome book. There's my friend Bill Crane over here who's a retired. Uh, uh, you were Navy, weren't you, Bill? <laughs> I knew that, Bill. <laughs> I, uh, I will probably go from Dad to Bathsheba this morning. I wrote out seven pages of notes. The only reason I stopped is that I ran out of paper. I probably would have kept going, so y'all better be glad the paper ran out. And uh, I, uh, I read a story the other day. It's, it's, I reckon it's true. I don't know. I believe everything I read in the newspaper. I don't even take the Evening Herald anymore because it's so full of trash I quit it. And don't tell those people down there I said that, but that's a fact. And I read this story the other day. A uh, guy was sitting in the, at Super Bowl, and there was an empty seat beside him. And he remarked uh, to that about that to a lady sitting nearby. And, and the lady responded, that was my husband's. But he died. I'm very sorry, said the man. Yet I'm really surprised that another relative or friend didn't jump at the chance to take the seat reserved for him. Beats me, she said. They all insisted on going to the funeral. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you decided to come here this morning. And uh, my other, the only other joke I know, I've never been a joke teller, is uh, about the little Baptist and little Catholic boys that became friends in school and they decided to visit each other's church and he went to the, little, to the Catholic church the first Sunday, and he explained everything to the little Baptist boy. And if you've ever been in a Catholic service, and I wish that, uh, that Jerry and uh, um, Jerry was up here this morning to tell you about the Catholic church. He grew up in the Catholic church in New York, and, and uh, he's here now. On a, he and Pat are two of the finest people I know from the north. They were Catholics. Now, y'all laughing. I, I know a lot of good folk, folks from the north. Uh, they're great people. They, they, were, they were Catholics until they came down here, and I remember that day in CMC in Charlotte when, when Jerry gave his life to Jesus. Never will forget that. He's never turned back. So a lot to tell a little Catholic boy, to tell a little Baptist boy. He got through with that. Next Sunday went to the Baptist church, and, and he's trying to tell the little Catholic boy what all was going on, and and uh, it wasn't as difficult for the Baptists as it was for the Catholics to explain everything that was happening. Until it got time for the preacher to get up and he took his watch off. And the uh, little Catholic boy had never seen that before. And he punched his Baptist friend and he said, Now what does that mean? The little Baptist boy looked over at him and he said, Nothing. <laughs> so I got it out here this morning, but it don't mean nothing. I hear they're going to serve lunch at uh, 1230. We will be finished by 1230, I promise. Because uh, preachers like to eat. If you wonder about that, look at Mike O'Dell. <laughs> if you wonder. <laughs> you see, and you've heard me, some of you, this is not a leather belt. This is a leather fence around a chicken graveyard. That's what that is. <laughs> But I want to tell you something. I, I keep hearing this word retirement. I don't want to hear that anymore. Larry Burkett, one of my favorite speakers and writers, I've referred to him before, wrote that book not long before he died, The Coming Economic Earthquake, and it's all being fulfilled in our time. I heard Burkett say more than one time, there is nowhere in the Bible that says a man ought to retire. Keep going until the end. 
Jimmy Draper just wrote a book recently. He was uh, president of Southern Baptist Convention for some years and then served at uh, Sunday School Board and it became Lifeway. Jimmy Draper wrote a book. I'm in the process of reading. Don't quit until you're finished. I'm not retiring because I'm not quitting. I'll continue to work somewhere. Uh, I pray every day that God won't put me on a shift, but God will let me, let me be actively involved in some church somewhere doing something. And I will continue, uh, Lord willing, and City of Rock Hill willing, I'll continue to serve as I have for over 20 years as a, uh, uh, as a uh, part-time judge in the city court. And we haven't been working for a few weeks, so we're just getting ready to start back. And uh, let me say something about that. When I, in fact, Chris Horton and his wife Jamie are here this morning. They were at Oakdale when I was, when I uh, uh, applied for that position uh, as a county magistrate. And uh, a lot of people, including a lot of preachers, really had some unkind things to say about me. They had to. Leaving the ministry. Let me tell you people, the greatest ministry that I have had for over 20 years has been in the courtroom. And I promise you that. I promise you. I know how to extend mercy, but ask this captain back here, Captain Allman, who's a dear friend of mine over the detective division, you ask him. I know how to be as mean as the devil can be sometimes. Am I right, Captain? Yes, sir. I tell these young kids who come before me, uh, I give them mercy, and I do, truly. I talk about mercy with them. Tell them how important mercy is, and God gives it to us every day, but I tell them this. If you ever have an officer put handcuffs on you again, you better start praying that old gray-headed man ain't sitting on the bench when you come back. Because I'm not like God. I don't keep extending mercy. It's too much of that going on in the world today, and I can talk about that a long time. So what am I going to talk about? Well, God, early in the week, and I... I love it when, particularly on early Monday mornings, God speaks to me, and God gives me some sermon thoughts. And uh, the word that God put in my mind was passion. That's not really what I wanted to say. I had other ideas. I remember that sermon, Robert. It's in a file somewhere. I could have brought 10,000 sermons here this morning and, and, and used them. I, I try not to do that. I've got boxes full of them. I've got file cabinets full of them. I try my best to listen to God truly and find his word for the week. And so that word passion just would not leave me. I tried to go other directions, and God brought me back to passion. Passion. Priority. And so I began to study. I began to, uh, to listen to the Lord speak to me. And so this is what we came up with. Let me, let me back up just a moment. There is a verse of Scripture that's really meant a lot to Mom and I the last few weeks. We see it every morning when we sit on our little porch and drink our coffee. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, To everything there's a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. I'm not retiring. I'm just moving into a new season in my life. I'm moving into a new season in my life. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, God has, God has other plans for us. Part of our plans is my caring for mother. And God placed us in the most wonderful place in the world. Here, you've cared for us. And then God gave us a home a few years ago and seated, seated here are two of the dearest friends we have on the earth. Dwayne and Brenda McDowell. They're our neighbors. We could not survive without Brenda and Dwayne. They're special to us. We came home from the hospital the other day and we had no more got in the door and here comes Brenda, she has so many times, she brought our meal. She makes the best cornbread in the world. Love her cornbread. But God put us in a place, that, there's no question in my mind, no doubt in my mind, that God put us in that place. I remember David, the Saturday night you called and said, Dad, I, we were looking for somewhere that was smaller and Less yard work and all these things. And David called us one Saturday night. I, I don't know whether David remembers it or not, but Daddy remembers. And, and David said, uh, I've told this story. Uh, I, I'm going to forget those seven pages and just share my heart. 
David called and said, Dad, I found you and Mama home. And he told me where it was, and I laughed. I remember laughing in the phone. I said, David, you're crazy. I said, there's nowhere your mom and dad can afford a house in a place like that. Passed it all our lives. And didn't save a lot of money. The kids spent it all. No inheritance because uh, they've already spent it. And uh, so, uh, uh, well, come here. Come here, broom. Verify this story I'm about, this lie I'm about to tell. Would you? Came to church on Sunday morning. I, I said, Lee, is there any way you could arrange for me to marry look at this house? He did. He and Ann met us over there, and we looked at it loved it. But the price was way beyond what these two people were able to afford. And uh, we t- kept talking about it. I went to, we left on a Wednesday to go to a conference at Myrtle Beach, Mom and I did. And uh, there was a break in the sessions, and she was up in the room, and I went up to check on her, and Lee called, and Lee said, Pastor, I made an offer, crazy offer, uh, crazy, crazy offer. I knew it wouldn't work. And Lee said, Pastor, you've bought yourself a home. I said, Lee, don't lie to me today. I'm not in the mood for that. Now, he's a realtor, so, you know, he's, you know. Look, keep looking. I ain't through yet with you. <laughs> Lee said you bought a home. Long story short, they accepted the offer. And Ralph Norman told me some days later, he said, I've never seen a house sell that cheap in that neighborhood. I said, Ralph, it's a God thing. God is marvelous, and God is wonderful, and God is awesome. And our God is a God of miracles. So let's get around to the sermon. I've got uh, five minutes to preach seven pages, and that won't be done easily, but we're going to do it. One of my heroes in the Bible is a man by the name of, uh, man by the name of, oh, what's his name? Oh, it's Paul. Paul. You all know what I did? I came up here this morning, honestly, and I don't have it in my notes with me. I don't think I do. <laughs> I think I left them all downstairs. Well, it's all up here anyway. That's honest truth. Well, Paul said in Philippians that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul did not say that I may know something about Jesus, that I may know Jesus. Beloved, listen to me carefully this morning. There is a world of difference. It's like night and day knowing something about Jesus and knowing Jesus. You know what made Paul the man of God that he was? He had one passion. He had one priority. That was Jesus. You know, as I sat and after the Lord gave me that word and I began to walk down memory lane and uh, talk about, uh, think about some things and some times in my life, uh, you know what? They're still missing. I thought maybe the Lord might work a miracle and put them in there, but he didn't. So they're still missing. So I'm going to wing it this morning. It's okay. Let me tell you some things. I walked back through my years. Perfect? No. Members of the union? Perfect? No. But I can tell this church something. I've made mistakes, but they've not been in the heart. They've been in the head. I love this church with all my heart and all my soul and all my mind. We've pastored some wonderful, wonderful people through the years but never a group of people who've cared about us. We've been through tough times. You remember I had the heart surgery and uh, other difficulties with various health. And you know what? You've been there for us. I said this last Sunday, but I won't say it again to Union Baptist Church. Soon you're going to call a new pastor. Listen to me carefully. Do not expect him to be a Ray Long. When God made me, he threw that mold away. There ain't another one like it. Yeah, thank God. Thank you, Jack. I'll remember that when I pray for you. Pray tonight. Your name won't be on my list. But I'm serious. I'm not the greatest preacher in the world. I'm not Billy Graham. I'm not Charles Stanley. Uh, I'm not any of these guys that are great. But I tell you what, God knows that I have a shepherd's heart. I have a pastor's heart. I'm there when my people need me. I've always been there when my people needed me and you know what 
when, when Greg called me the other morning at 5 and said, Pastor, I hate the body is so early, but Nancy's had a heart attack. Now, I know a lot of these young whippersnappers would jump up and put their, their faded jeans or their holy jeans on and run down to the hospital. That's okay. That's what they want to do. God will forgive them. It's okay. When I got up, I put my suit on. I came down there dressed like somebody. You know where I learned that from, Howard? When I used to visit, and Dr. Wilson back here will remember him, when I used to visit the emergency room at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning in the old hospital, he was always there. Probably delivered more babies than anybody in Rock Hill. That was old Dr. Frank Gaston. Frank Gaston Boulevard. I never went to that hospital, doctor. Anytime. Whenever it was, there he was. Old Dr. Gaston. You know what? He didn't have holy jeans on. He had a suit on. <laughs> he dressed like he was a doctor. <laughs> he acted like he was a doctor. I reckon I learned from him, and maybe not the preachers, but I, that's just been a part of me. You know, it's okay if your new pastor comes and wears holy jeans in the pulpit. I was with a, a pastor of First Baptist Church in Spartanburg a few, a couple of years ago. Uh, Dr. Wilton and his son, his son pastors a big church down in New Orleans, and me and I had a great time with him and getting to know him, and his son wore holy jeans every time he spoke, but he spoke the Word of God. I don't have any problem with that. I'm just simply saying to you, love your new pastor the way you've loved me. Treat him as kindly as you've treated Mary and I. Love him, but don't expect him to be the person that I am because I'm me and he's going to be he. I started to say it might be she, but I don't think so, you know. I don't think that's going to happen. Let, let me tell you something. There's some very special, I hate to start calling names, but Miss Jean Black's here this morning with her daughter. Miss Jean's in the... Uh, retirement home. Her daughter called me yesterday. Her mom wanted to come today. Miss Jean, you know how much I appreciate your uh, you don't know how much I appreciate your being here today. Special, special lady. One of the things that's hurt me the most in these past few weeks, months, has been that I've not been able to visit the retirement in nursing homes. And these people, they're two precious ladies here. Sandy and Gail, whose mom Dearest friend of ours, she'd be here this morning, but she's, she's locked up. If you want to have a heart attack, go ahead and have it. We've got two doctors here this morning. Now, I've got to say something about Dr. Robert here. Robert Wilson, Robert, Robert Wilson, Robert Jackson. Cameron, our, our oldest grandson, he, he looks as well as his granddad. Lives over at Clemson, the University of South Carolina. <laughs> he was about 18 months old. She recalled me one day and said, I've got him in the emergency room and said, Cameron has had an accident. Well, I rushed over there and I walked in and this kid's nose was split from here to here. I started crying and Sherry said, Mr. Long, get out of the room. That's what you remember that, Sherry? He said, get out of here. You're going to get him upset. He's laying there. He ain't, he ain't phased by it. I said, who's going to fix him? Dr. Wilson came in. You look at that boy today, you'd never know that his nose was literally split in two in this man right here. We've had some great friends through the years. But now back to the sermon. Paul had a passion. Let me tell you something. I have sought the best I could through the years to have one priority and one passion. His name is Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name. I want to tell you something. Robert gave you a great testimony. That's what Jesus can do for anybody. He can change anybody's life. He can make you a new person. He, he can take you when you're rock bottom, as this gentleman was. And Jesus Christ can change you. He can transform you. He can make you into a brand new person. You know, you know what America needs today? Jesus. America needs Jesus. I heard Dr. Ben Carson last night on a, a, a Governor Huckabee's program. And, and Governor Huckabee asked him, well, well, doctor, what changed you from being someone out there throwing bricks through, through windows? You know, what, you know what Dr. Carson said? One word, God. And then he went on to explain how one day he picked up a Bible and God changed and transformed his life 
and made him into one of the greatest neurosurgeons in the world. Godly man. Never hear him talk that he, that, hey, I found those notes. <laughs> all right, all right. I don't need anything from the peanut gallery, Chris. <laughs> Jesus, 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 Jesus. There's something about that name. Uh, I, I must do this very quickly. Let me tell you my uh, another passion I have had. And that's a passion. Uh, that's a passion that uh, Christians not only be saved, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but that Christians grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Grow as a Christian. Uh, members of union will tell you that's been one of my things. Grow, grow, grow. And you, you're going to do that. There are two avenues through which you can grow. You know what they are? They're the Word of God and prayer. You'll, ne you'll never amount to much as a Christian unless there is a, a lot of time you spend in this Word and you spend in prayer with God. Let me tell some of these people who've never heard. You know what, you know what definition of prayer is? The greatest I've ever read, and I've read a lot of them. Prayer is a conversation between two people who love each other. You know, what I love? you know what mom and I love to do? Sit on the porch and just talk. Watch the birds talk. Conversation. Now, I must admit she takes up all the time. <laughs> she speaks most. Well, you know what? You know, you know, you know how, how that is? Most of us as Christians go to God or to Jesus with an agenda or a list of things that we want him to do for us. And we talk to him, and we close the conversation and walk away. Real prayer is not only talking to God, it's listening to God. And if you aren't taking time to listen, to just simply sit and listen. My early morning hours, I try to follow the example of Jesus, who got up early in the morning and went out and conversed with the Father. The greatest conversations you'll ever have are conversations early in the morning when you're talking to God the Father. That's what Jesus did. I wish I had a lot of time to talk about that. I've talked about that very much. Jesus didn't do his thing. He did the Father's thing. You know what most of us do? Our thing. Rather than do the Father's thing. And Jesus spent time early in the morning. Father, what do you want me to do? Now I know people look at me and they say, Preacher, do you really believe that today God still speaks to people? Amen. A thousand times over. God speaks to us if we're willing to take time to listen. Members of this church know the story. Came out of an early morning prayer meeting between me and God. When God told me to call Tom Rayner or send a letter to Tom Rayner and ask him to come to, y'all remember that, 175th anniversary. Most ridiculous thing anybody could do. Ask that man to come here to York County and speak in this church. Long story short, you know what? I wrote him a letter, prayed about it, and God told me to write him, and I thought it was foolish. Tom Rayner came stood in this pulpit a few years ago. Why? Out of a conversation I had with God early one morning. Listen, let me tell you something else about the Bible. I have to tell you this. When we move from where we are, where, where we were to where we are, I lost this Bible. It's the one that my parents gave me on Christmas, 1955. My parents gave me this Bible. They had gone to my pastor, Dr. Tom Haggai, and they got him, they didn't know exactly what kind of Bible to buy, uh, their son, and so that's Dr. Haggai, and he bought, he got this Bible for my parents. I'd be interested to know how, how much they, uh, well, it got lost. It was torn all to pieces, so uh, when we moved, I put it somewhere that I thought it would be safe. But y'all know what happened? I forgot where I put it. <laughs> Ever do that? Last night, just last night, I was out scaring around in the, in the garage, which is my library, and I, I saw the book I was looking for. In fact, here it is. That's the book I was looking for, Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation. And I saw a cover, a black cover, zip up on top of it, and I had to move that to get this. Do y'all want to know what was in that little old black bag? This Bible. Been looking for it. Thought Mary had hid it from me somewhere. Thought it just got lost. 
But I want to read you something Dr. Haggai said to me. Uh, my young friend and member, Ray Jr., it thrilled me to know that you, your folks were planning to give you the Bible. Yet I was more happy because I knew you'd cherish this book and let its message be written on your heart. May the author of this book lead you each step of each day, and especially when Satan comes in his sneaking, tempting allurement. Dr. Tom Haggai, pastor at West End Chapter. Found that. Boy, I read those again and wept. You know, does anybody know, does anybody know what kind of Bible this is? I will give you a special place at the dinner table today if anybody here can tell me something about this Bible. What kind of Bible is it? Given to me in 19, 1955. What kind of Bible was it? A King James, but what else? Schofield Study Bible. If you didn't have a Schofield Study Bible, King James Version, you'd go to hell probably. <laughs> It's about that bad. I mean, you know, it's a great Bible, but that's what it was. I, I, mean, it's all, I didn't know anything for years. I had to repent the first time I picked up another version. That's God to forgive me and help me. Uh, let me go. I, I, I got it. Y'all, please. Y'all know what next, sun, next Sunday will be, don't you? Some of you are wondering why I'm wearing this, don't you? Because you know how patriotic I am. I always had a great patriotic service. When I was down at Oakdale, uh, uh, these folks will tell you, we, that was a big day. We had some awesome days. Had the governor come in and had his dad come in who had been president of the convention and Harry Dith and some great guys. Because I, you see, I'm a red-blooded American. The only time my blood isn't red is when I'm at Clemson at Floyd Orange, son. But I'm a red-blooded American. Let me tell you something. I love this country. Some of you wondering what you, let me tell you three reasons real quickly. And I do have quite a few. You know how I love this country. I love it with all my heart. Mr. Bill, I'd take up arms today. If I were the commander, we wouldn't be having happen in our streets what's happening today. We got a bunch of spineless, good for nothing, no account politicians. That's why, that's why we got troubles today. And we got a bunch of terrorists. We got a bunch of anarchists being funded by foreign countries, being funded by rich communists in this country, and being funded by, excuse me, the Democrat Party. Oh, you know, I thought about, should I say that? You know what? You can't fire me because I done already quit. <laughs> you can't fire me because I done quit. Let me tell you something, I love this country. I have pages, this book right here, if you don't, this is my second Bible. If you don't have it, you need to get it. I had the privilege to hear Dave Barton speak a number of times about the separation. Anybody tells you this country was not founded on the Christian religion and faith are, are telling you a lie out of hell. And when, the other morning when I walked into the den and the TV was on news and I saw them pull down a statue of Christopher Columbus, you know what I did? I wept. I wept. I wept. Listen, I could show you if I had time this morning these things that are happening in this country were plans of the Communist Party many years ago. Tear down our history. Destroy our heroes. Rip out of the ground monuments. They don't say, we're at war. And it ain't going to stop anytime soon. The COVID-19 virus is bad. Ask Sherry back here, our daughter-in-law. She'll tell you. She spent two weeks in bed with it. I'll tell you how bad it is. It is nothing compared to the anarchy in the streets of America today. We can outlive the virus. We're not going to outlive this terrorist attack on our country. Friends. Edmund Burke said all that's necessary for, for evil to, 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 to prosper is for good men to do nothing. It's time to stand up. Every time I hear them talk about, and there's several uh, officers, law enforcement officers here. I was talking last night on the phone with, uh, with Chief Mobley. He was in law enforcement 42 years. Is that right, Chief? 42 years, sir. Ended up as chief of the York Police Department. You know what he said to me? It's the worst I've ever seen. Chief Chris Watts called me the other day. I'd send him a letter. 
just simply saying, I appreciate you all, I'm praying for you, blah, blah, blah. He called me and he said, I want to thank you for that letter. You know what, he's been there, what, 30 years, Captain? 32 years, on the phone. He watched said, Ray, I've never seen it as bad as it is. You've been there how long, Captain? 23 years. Well, the finest, godliest man I know. Has it ever been any worse in your time? It's rough. We need to respect policemen. We need to respect them. Because they're, they're out there. They're the, when, when Mom and I had that experience some months ago, you remember? When a deranged man came to our door at 1.30 on Sunday morning, walking in, in a pair of just under shorts, stepped inside our house, and had a package in his hand, later found out it was a gun. By the grace of God, I was able to pick him up. You know what I called? I called the Department of Social Service and asked them, could they please send a social worker out there and help me out? That's what some of these idiots are saying. Send social workers. Social workers to do what? Go save my life. It wasn't five minutes. I could hear sirens coming from every direction. My street was lined up with police officers. In an hour's time, that big old dog, Captain, had tracked him down, and they caught him. What do you do when you got trouble? You don't call social services. You don't call mental health. You call the police. Abandon the police, and that's what some are trying to do. They're trying to, uh, that, that's our, the Bible, the Word of God in the book of Romans gives them a place in our society. Listen, folks, we are in the greatest land in all the world. Now, let me close. Get, get, mm. Yeah. I smell them steaks. <laughs> let, me, let me say a couple of things that are up here. Some people have said, I've been bootlegging the gospel all these years. So I decided the best thing I could do is just bring my certificate of license and my ordination certificate, both, Chris, from the Oakdale Baptist Church. Uh, December the 10th, 1961, I was ordained. August in 61, I was licensed. 61, I was licensed. So I'm, I'm, I'm legit. I've got the credentials from the powers that be, Jerry. Y'all are wondering about some of this stuff. Anybody know what this is? Anybody know what that is? You know what it is? Huh? That's a, that's a motorcycle. <laughs> I mean, y'all know what that is. What kind of army? That's a German. I brought it this morning to tell you something, folks. My dad brought this home from the Second World War. He brought home also a German, uh, a German uh, machine gun. I'm thinking about my boys. They actually been on the internet trying to find me bullets for that that uh, gun. You found them yet, Jay? You still looking for them? Oh. See why I bought that. If these people that in the streets, as anarchists and rioters and looters, if they knew the history of our country, would not be there. They wouldn't be there. They don't know what men like this man, what men like my dad, what men like many others, the price they paid for our freedom. They fought and they bled and they died. I was with Chris and Jamie over in France some years ago, thanks to him and, and his dear dad who's home in heaven waiting for us. Uh, they made it possible for Mary and I to take a, an extended trip through Europe. We were in France. We saw those, we saw those cemeteries like, like, the, uh, like the cemetery in, in Washington, those little white crosses everywhere. Dr. Wilson, Sandy, went to, went, to D, went to Normandy a few years ago, and I told them, bring me something back. So they brought me the D-Day boat back. Let me, let me tell you why I'm so, so patriotic and such, a, such an American that I am. Number one, because God saved me. You cannot separate faith in God from faith in your country. Those two go hand in hand. Let me tell you something else. I know the history. I know what my freedom, I know what my freedom cost me. I know what my freedom, it cost, it cost many people their life. They bled and they died. Thank you, Mr. Bill. In fact, if you're a veteran, stand up. I won't be here to do this next week, so I'll just get a jump on everybody. If you're a veteran, please stand up for me. I want to recognize you. If you're a veteran. (laughs) 
Thank you, men. Thank you, men and women. I know Susan uh, was in the service, so I appreciate I thank you for what you did. Uh, this book right here, if you don't have it, you need to get it. You can see, you can see it's got a lot of, I, I got about three or four pages of quotes from here, from Washington, when they took the, when they defaced the monument of George Washington, when they're trying to take down the, the statue of President Grant in New York. But I'll tell you something, this is stupidity. And if we don't stop it soon, you know what one of them said the other day? Look at these stained glass windows. You know what one of them said the other day? He said, it's time. We start taking down those stained glass pictures of Jesus in the churches. I told somebody that the other day. You know what they looked at me and they said, that'll never happen. As my David used to say, hide and watch. Unless we stand up, they will, in time, try to deface wonders of Jesus in churches. Another one said the other day, don't get, if you don't give us what we want, we're going to take it. And because we've got spineless, good-for-nothing, no account, worthless politicians, so it'll all be run out of office. And elect some men who love this country, who love God, who love freedom for us. All right. Now let me close. I don't want to. I love to preach. And I'm sure God's going to give me some more opportunity. Uh, some, some church somewhere, I'll get a chance to finish this sermon. Let me, let me tell you the two other things I, I've got a passion for, I have to share. Uh, I was at your house the other day, Howard. I noticed you had this book sitting in a prominent place where you use it. If you, if you want a good devotional book, you need to get Experiencing God Day by Day by Henry Blackwood. And shaking her head. It's the greatest devotional. And I've got scores of them in my life. Mr. Bill shaking his head. I mean, I, I wish I could just read today's devotional. That speaks to what I've been talking about, about having a time with God and about the importance of the Bible. Let me talk about this. I have to. Among my passions, and this church knows this, is a passion that everybody who claims to be a Christian is truly a born-again child of God. Dr. Billy Graham said 50 to 75% of the people whose names are on church roll will die and go to hell. Read in Matthew where Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. I read that one day some years ago. It just gripped my soul like nothing. Just because you say you're a Christian don't mean you're a Christian. There are two books you need to read. You need to read J.D. Greer. He's the president of Southern Baptist Convention right now. He wrote a book, Stop Asking Jesus in Your Heart. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's a powerful, powerful book. But there's a new one on, on the scene now. Thomas Broom gave me this one, here I am, or maybe both of them. This one, too, is awesome, The Unsaved Christian. Many years ago, I heard a preacher say, some people think they walk the magic aisle, they shake the magic hand, they say the magic word, and zip over you in the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't work that way. And many, many people are going to die and go to hell because they thought baptism, they thought church membership, they thought good life. You see, Jesus said, you know, Thomas said, Lord, uh, John 14, Jesus, uh, how do we know that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man, no man, no man cometh to the Father except through Jesus. One of the dearest friends I had in this church is Eddie Philbeck. I never called on Eddie to do anything that Eddie wasn't. Johnny on the spot ready. I preached something similar to that about be sure you know that you know that you know. Paul said, I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded he's able to keep that which after me done him against that day. John said, these things are written that you might know, not think so, hope so, maybe so. No, 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 no. I preached that emphatically one Sunday morning. Eddie and his dear grandmother, Miss Margie, walked out of here, they always parked right over here. Got in the car. Before that car was cranked, Eddie put his hand over on Miss Margie's and said, I can't remember exactly. What did he call Miss Margie? Mama. Mama. Said, uh, said, Mama, said, we know that we know that we know, don't we? It wasn't a few weeks that I got that call that Monday morning, Lee, and I rushed from Rock Hill. Suddenly, unexpectedly, Eddie passed and went home. 
you're sitting here this morning, I'm in good health. You don't know, as the finest young men I met, Mac back here. Prayer meeting Wednesday night, sitting right back there. After service, I talked to him and Mac. How you doing, Andy? Huh? That very night, he had a heart attack. He's in heaven. Because he knew that he knew that he knew that he knew that. Do you know that you know that you know that you know if you died today? Do you know what? There are two doctors here. You could have a heart attack this morning. You know what? I asked the doctor down with, with uh, Andy the other morning, 1 o'clock over in the morning, had done a heart cath. said he had three blockages, and we opened them. I said, uh, doctor, I said, was one of those a widow maker? <laughs> he looked at me, and he said, I don't even like that word. He said, any one of them can be the widow maker. They can take you out. Lord, we love you. This church means more to me and Mary than we could ever say in words. So many people whose names I would love to call today. I want to say, Lord, I thank you, Mr. Larry's home from the hospital. What a saint of God he is. Wonderful man. In and out of the hospital, home. But I thank you for him, many others like him, who've been so kind and generous, Mom and I, through the years. Tomatoes. Cucumbers, squash, whatever. Whatever they had, they shared it. One of the most sharing congregations I've ever met. I've never seen a congregation give as generously as this congregation gives to so many people in times of need. And I want to thank you for that. I pray that spirit will continue, Father. I pray, Lord, as a pastor search committee begins its task of finding a pastor, I pray that you already have placed it in the heart of some man somewhere that it's time for him to leave where he is. It's time for him to go somewhere else. He may not know where that somewhere else is. But I pray that you begin to prick his heart as you have mine so many times through the years to tell me. Mama asked me, Mama asked me, well, Ray, why why are we leaving? Because Mama's time. You just know in your heart of hearts as a pastor, you know you've served your Lord, you've served the people, you've done the best that you possibly could do, and now it's time to move on. We're moving on. But we're trusting you to guide every step of our, our days. And Lord, I pray you'd guide this search committee. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would guide the person, whomever he is, Father, you'd guide them to this place where they might be able to serve you in a faithful way to a very loving congregation. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. All of you, pre- please stay for lunch. Please do. Uh, Greg, you got any? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go over a couple things with you here. What we're going to do is we're going to, just a minute, sing Bless Be the Tie. And then I'm, after that, I'm going to ask another one of our associational leaders, Mike Wallace, if he'll bless the meal for us. But first of all, those of you that are watching downstairs, when we do dismiss our service, we're going to ask that the, the folks up here in the sanctuary that you go down first. When you go down, please go to a table and you'll be directed where to be seated. And then once everybody's seated, you'll be called up to go get your food uh, through, the, through the food line. And of course, we do have some tents and tables set up, uh, quite a few, but especially for Ray and his family, there's a special section for them. They'll be directed where to sit. So remember, when we go down, go find a table, Take your seat there, and then we'll call up by rows or by a few tables at a time, uh, call up to the, to the uh, food service line to keep it a little bit more orderly. And remember, there, there'll be some special presentations after we get our food. Uh, we have a, uh, another speaker that's going to share with us, Jerry, about Jerry Sosby is going to share with us a little bit about Ray, and, of course, you'll have an opportunity as well. Also in the foyer, in the bulletin board, there's some pictures of, of uh, Ray and some of our members and other things that relate to his ministry here at our church. So be sure to uh, take a look at that either during the meal, afterwards, or before if you get a chance to do that. Let's uh, stand up.
Let's sing our closing song, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, and then Mike Wallace will lead us or uh, bless our meal for us. Let's sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Mike, if you'll lead us in the rest of the group. Father, we thank you for our time together today. Thank you for the beautiful spirit present in this service today. Father, we thank you for Ray and for Mary Long. 59, 60 years of faithful service, commitment to your kingdom by growing and helping your church. Bless them. Father, we thank you for the food and for all that's been prepared for us, for every hand that's been involved, every person that's planned, every person that's made it possible. We pray that you'd bless them. Now use this food to nourish our body today. And Father, as this service and this time of celebration extends, we pray that you would bless this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.